Music work, sure, okay, see it, see it. That rhythm is the greatest computer rhythm of all time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but you, you, you know, one of the things that made the sound and the change happening, happen the way it did, is that um, I decided, like, look, I'm recording at everybody's studio. We don't have any privacy or anything. I'm going to build a studio myself. In those days, basically only one set of equipment was in Jamaica. There was a brand called, um, it was a Sony brand called MCI. MCI was the brand equipment. And I said, like, why again, being trying to do things differently, I said, there must be other equipment out there available, man, that we can look at. And, you know, I went to UK and I ran into a company, um, uh, AMA company, and we bought a brand new console from them. So there's nothing like that in Jamaica. We then went on and we found Atari made two track and it was a new model. So we had new models and different models of everything. So those things combined together just gave the, a, a different sound to where it was shifting there from fully analog to, to analog slash digital. And, you know, we had so much great musicians here who was learning and understand different things. So, you know, we just work with it and it worked itself out. And the other most important thing is that whatever I am or wherever I end up in life, it was never about me. I mean, I am the CEO. I am the guy who crosses the T's and that the I's. But I had a great team of creative people. The Mikey Bennett's and Carlton Nines and Hopes and Linda's writers and the Stephen Stanley and the Soul, the God rest his soul. And my second, Mikey Small. I had a great team of people around me. So they couldn't, I, I mean, I can't tell you what is A flat, C flat, B flat, you know. But I, 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 I know when I hear what I want, it, that's what I want. So I, I kind of have a different creative approach to everything, you know. And I have the team around me that understands and can interpret musically what I need. And that is what make we end up where we are. And as I said, Every song, voice, every rhythm laid, I am in there. I am a 100% hands on. And that's what production is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You are the CEO, you are responsible. And music, it makes good sense to micromanage because if you want, if you have an idea where you want to end up, I mean, you have to go the journey. And that has always been the way I do things. And you really were the only one who had that kind of Motown strategy. It, it was coincidental, really. You know? It was just the way how I saw that things should be done. And because that would allow me to stay involved. And, you know, I mean, if I don't like the song, I'm not going to record it. An artist can't turn up and tell me, okay, is this song me going to today? No, I need to hear the song before. And in most, and, and to approve it, because sometimes, I'm a creative myself in terms of the ideas and what it should say and not be said and what should be said. So I, I'm able to provide a good guideline to the creatives and saying, okay, I think if we put this verse at the second verse, I'm let's put the, the hook up the top, let's bet the chorus bit, you know. So I provide all of that inside too. So it was coincidental that, you know, we had all of that team, but I recognize that look. Too much persons in Jamaica is providing information and doing things in areas of which they do not are competent and qualified. And they are competent and qualified people out there. You just need to get them involved and compensate them adequately. It worked for me. I'm still doing it to a point. What can you tell me about Carlton Hines? Carlton Hines, great, great person, great songwriter. He was a member of the group called Tetrak. I mean, it's someone I, can, I tried with the group, but... I found out that we weren't getting the kind of success that we needed. And Carlton just, when Carlton just had a unique skill and talent in writing, for example, rumors that he wrote, right? We were doing a Mighty Diamonds project and the rumors was a song for the Mighty Diamonds. And I said like, no, 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 no. This is not a Mighty Diamonds song. This is a Greg Isaac song. And we removed it from the project. And Greg Isaac turned up at the studio same day. We said to him, Gregory, daddy, daddy. He said, fine, yes, we agree. The rest is history. It was Cleavy, Robbie Lynn, and Danny Brownie. A lot of people believe that Steely played it, but he never had anything to do with it. Now, one of the things with me, you know, I am aware 
of the ability and the responsibility and supposedly the resources that a record producer should be equipped with. So for example, I'll do a song with somebody and I'll have somebody else record it. Because I, I believe that a song make it a singer, not a singer make a song. One it wonders can prove that to you. So if I, I mean, if you look at, for example, let's say Maxi Priest, just a little bit longer, right? That song was recorded by and for Dennis Brown. And when Maxi Priest came in, project came on, I had Maxi Priest sing it. So I'll even send you something with the Dennis Brown versions of it too. Now with rumors, I knew that it was originally supposed to be for Mighty Diamonds. Did they did they lay down a vocal track for that? Or did you just hear no, the song? No, and... the, the track wasn't laid down for it for them. We just when I heard it and I'm like, the style, the form, kind of rude boy, kind of catch an attitude. And I just removed it from the demo stage. Because what we did in those days, a couple of things our approach was, we'll create a demo or record the song in a key of a couple of different verses that we think will fit it and we intend to approach. So we get proper singers and not, you know, established singers to do the demos. So when we give it to an artist, and he, I call it a producer's demo. So I don't give him a demo with a piano alone, banging, he gets music, everything. So when you hear something that sounds like it can be successful, you will want to be a part of it. So this is how I'm telephone of GSC Lodge. When we when, when, when we realized the same thing, so when do the rhythm, GSC didn't know nothing about it. She didn't like it first. And we said to our GSC, this is it. And we she took it to a man or manager. Errol says yes, the next year she voiced it. The rest is history. As I said. A song make it a singer, not a singer make a song. And I've noticed that with just songwriting, because there there have been some artists who write their own songs and you can hear them repeat certain words and phrases and, and stuff. Sometimes too emotionally involved, you know? I mean, you know, a guy can be writing a song, for example, and, you know, it create a problem within his house and uh, something or some personal conflict and he has an emotional attachment. For me, I take two approach. First, to develop the song where I hear it in terms of creatively. Then after, once the, the lead vocal go on, I take, I complete it in regards to what I think is best in terms of having it be a commercial success. That's my approach. Only when you're a producer who recognize what your role should be and you try to fulfill it, then you have that ability to command or demand those things to re I'm ensure it happens, you know? Right. And I do. When did you open Music Work Studio? Music Work Studio, pretty much around 87, 88, because the Rumors was the first project out that came out in 88, why it's called Showcase 88. So we started building pretty much around 87-ish. We usually do record distribution there, you know? Um, distribute records, and that is how we had a limited space, but we made it work and created the studio. And then we, I mean, did, we moved everything later on to Slipe Road at about 92, you know. So we're there pretty much 87 to 92. Holding on, on P. Cockatee and Shabarangs. So what happened is that, um, as I said, we were working with uh, Mikey Bennett as a part of our writing team, and he was like a principal coordinator manager of you know the stuff that we were doing you know so he was at jammies before and i said you know mikey let's you know let's do some work together and i had him as part of the writing team and coordinating and being a lead vocal supervisor when we were recording vocals and with a lead or background and he sang the leads and the backgrounds also too but and he had his group home tea you know our home tea for then so we just said, you know, let's do a project with them, you know. Pretty much ran into Shabarang, Sunsize, Raw, Talent and thing. So I just said, well, you know, let's create a project with, with them all, you know. And had Mikey supervise the whole thing and, you know, we did it. It worked. How did Coco T come into the, the picture? Coco T pretty much was an artist that we saw the same way. Good, great and around and... Let's not, and, and I believe that different things are having different flavors and different artists have different styles to projects. It enhances it and makes projects end up being different. And I also believe that historically they'll, they'll have a value because, you know, things like these don't, then was happening really. 
So, you know, it was just felt, it felt good then and we did it because of those bases. Again, when you mentioned like your more obscure productions or the ones that didn't hit as big, it was off of the authorized album and it's a song called Like a Love Song. Loving you is like a love song. <laughs> yeah. song. I think that was a Mikey Bennett writing song, I think. It's what I, I, I am attached to certain kind of songs. I am not into the killing people and the murder and the bad mind and the envy and the cuss and the war. You know, I, I'm, I just believe in love and prosperity and peace and all of this will work. So those songs, you know, really, really resonate with me. And many times you probably notice these songs where you probably hear one artist do it on a project and another artist do it on another project. It shows how much I believed in the song. And it turns out it, it's a big hit over in Japan. Yes, yes. I think we did a album or a compilation album by that name. I think it was also named, an album was named after it in Japan. Different countries sometimes name different albums, different things because their market. For example, Showcase 88 in the United States, right? It was called Telephone Tracks. Right. So different places from a marketing perspective have different views on how you know, they think they can kind of push it in that market. And it didn't bother me. I, I have, you know, don't bother me. Now, around the late 80s, you also uh, worked with Island Records. Yeah, I'm, we were doing so well then that Island Records felt that, okay, they have some artists and some project that they think we could. So they sent in Aswad and Courtney Pine and we did a various artist album for them called Ram Dance Hall. And, you know, it was fine. Just like the Maxi Priest, it was Erskine Thompson, Erskine Thompson was his manager then, felt that we could have added some value to him and do something different. So they, you know, it was our business. Now, as what? The Two Wicked yeah. album. Well, I mean, Chris Black will actually call me and said, look, you know, we have a group here and we think they are one of the biggest things that's going to happen. We'd like you to do a project. Whatever you want to do, just do. And, you know, they are paying the bills and put some money up. And I mean, it was a great, great project and a great set of musicians and creative persons. We never had no problem whatsoever under the sun. And I mean, we even brought in Shabarangs on the project too. And, you know, it, it was just magic. It was, it was a real creative project because they themselves are talented many different ways. So everything complemented and enhanced. And the chemistry was great. It was a great project. No egos, nothing, you know. It's kind of like Deborah Glasgow, Champion Love and Green Sleeve. They just had this artist here, they felt like, okay, we think that, you know, with what you're doing, we can get something and how can we go about it? And we kind of work, work it out, crunch the numbers, cross the T's, that the eyes. And, you know, Champion Lover, I mean, end up being actually, when we recorded later on, become the biggest song Shabarangs ever did in his life, the Mr. Lover Man. Another thing was also the, the vocal sampling in your productions at that time. Yeah, how that started, we were fortunate enough to have had a Steve Stanley as our in-house mixing engineer. So Steve Stanley was coming out of a Island Records compass point, you know, real top of the line thing. So a lot of those stuff is how he felt what he wanted to do. And a lot of the stuff we had them in a, I think it's called a Yamaha, RM7 or XPX, something or another, where we would store the samples and we would trigger them the way we feel. And then, so a lot of them was a Steve Stanley idea, which it felt good and right, and we approved it and, and did it. So a lot of them was much more of a Steve Stanley sound. Because he's kind of a crazy one to as an engineer. He's extremely animated. Even the song, you know, that song, um, what it's called, Genius of Love Songs. Spin up, spin up. Yep. I mean, he is the one who created that hook phrase, what he says, although others are credited enough. He's the one who created it. Yeah. He played, he told me, he played it himself. He said even when he was working and it, he locked um, the guy and his wife out and he created it, did all of that when they came out, they loved it. But he's not credited for it. And he said to me clearly that many times they have tried to don't play his innovation. But he said clearly, I did this. They were not in there. And that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I have never heard him tell a lie from I know him to know. 
very straight, straightforward, great guy, professional. There's no other re reggae engineer that I have ever used or run into who is as professional as Stephen Stanley. And I think he's the best Jamaica has ever had. So Music Works lasted up until 92, and then you went on to open Anchor? We had Anchor at Windsor Avenue. So what we did is we brought in some U.S. acousticians and we modeled the sound of, of, studio, of the studio at Slide Road and create, recreated it in Studio One. And we actually created three studios at Slide Road. Three different sound, three different spacing, three different budget. It was three different styles. So the intent was while we are doing our work in, in a studio, clients can work in other studios if they wanted. So we did tons of stuff. And even while the building was being built, we built an outside studio called Studio 3. And we recorded tons of stuff in there, like in some Muta Baruka stuff, some Freddie McGregor stuff, you know. So we were, we were we never had any downtime. Yeah, so things were really booming during that time because you oh, had yeah. people like Fattis Burrell who was... Mm -hmm. Constantly it using home. it. Yeah. It was his own. <laughs> he didn't use any other studio, did he? Uh, no, not really. Not, uh, you have time when me and him fall out, you know, because sometimes we fall out, you know, and that was part of our chemistry. We were, we fall out, but we loved each other. But the, the most beautiful thing is that we have the ability to recognize that it's just a thing, you know. It's, it's not personal. It's not serious. We just have disagreement and during our time of disagreement, you know, we might teach keep apart, but we always come right back. I mean, Tootsie Bird was kind of his place to, Sly and Rob was kind of their home, their go-to place, it, you know, it has served a whole lot of persons well in that Sly, that Windsor Avenue complex. I mean, it's the largest recording complex in this city, in King, in Jamaica. You play them now, they still sound fresh. Yeah, man. Because it was not just about like one bomb, thank you, mom. It's kind of like, you know, a whole lot of work was put in them and a whole lot of great persons were involved in them. And, you know, persons love what they were doing. Like I tell people, I do what I love. I love what I do and what I do loves me back. So I'm happy, you know, and persons who were using our facilities kind of, you know, work that way. And we also created many models and structures how people could work comfortable and, don't worry about the bill and thing. And only when it don't pay at the end of the month, there's a problem. And, right. you know, we, we give people creative space on them many different ways and means. So we made it work for people to see Anchor as the go-to place. And people love the sound and the convenience of, you know, the facility. So we're good. When did everything switch to digital in your studio? Pro Tools, Pro Tools made that change. Pro Tools. So when Pro Tools came in, I don't remember the year, pretty much that is when things started changing digitally. They were Pro Tools to, is kind of like Pro Tools and, and, and Waves, Waves plugins. It, I tell people it's kind of like the Microsoft Office of Business. You must have it. So Pro Tools made the change. One of the problems is that too many people took Pro Tools or any you know digital workstations to be the way to go. It, it is, it is an, an add-on tools to help you work better and not necessarily in real time at your own time. While in analog, you have to get it right in real time. So that is how we use Pro Tools and it just made a whole lot of sense and we just saw that things weren't going to go backwards, you know. So we endorse it. We have actually became like the Caribbean, the Jamaican um, distributor for the product. So we install it in tons of studios and we have plugins and we just find that people prefer to, you know, kind of crack and pirate stuff more than buy them. So, you know, yeah. but Pro Tools changed the dynamics of the digital 